Buongiorno, and welcome again to another grab bag episode. Now, I hope you're wearing your rain gear. I have my bumper shoot, my bumberella, uh, anyway, to keep the rain off, you know, because today we're going to be talking about Jesus walking on the water and Peter almost drowning, and it's going to get really wet, so you, you might want to get something that will, okay, get rid of it, Rob. Here I am at the NCC studios. <laughs> I decided I would come in early on Sunday morning and do this grab bag here. Okay, so anyway, there you go. Wait, 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 wait. I forgot the opening music. Oh no. Welcome, welcome, bonjour, no. Welcome to our grab bag. Okay, that's enough of that. Let me go ahead and uh, set up my timer. If I can get to that quickly. Okay. So now you're still dry, right? Okay, good. So push the button and let us know that you're joining this video session. I think the release date for this one is March 21st which in 1954 was a mediocre, 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 mediocre day in American history, because that's the day I was born. Yeah, today's my birthday, birthday. The first day of spring. And that's one of the reasons that I was saddled with a girl's name like Robin. I know a lot of you people probably thought my name was Robert and then I just told people to call me Rob, but no, God bless my mother and father. They gave me the name Robin. And sometimes I just feel like a boy named Sue. How do you do? Now you're going to, oh no, no, that won't work. Not for, not for this grab bag. Okay. I want to thank you for your encouragement. You may say, you may say, what encouragement? Well, the encouragement that you bring the church by your attendance and the encouragement you bring me personally. Um, you know, you, you encourage the church when you participate in the Zoom um, lessons, when you participate in these lessons, when you participate in Sunday morning worship online or on site, when you, when you give your offerings, um, it's just an encouragement to the church, and I thank you for that. But you encourage me personally, because in doing these and finding out that people are watching them, I'm encouraged with the truth that there are still men and women who hunger and thirst for the word of God. They wanna fill their souls and strengthen their spirits. And so thank you very much. We've been studying John chapter six, and I may have mentioned this before or maybe not, but this chapter informs us of an absolutely crucial point in the ministry of Jesus. In fact, in God's entire plan of redemption. And I think you'll come to understand why I'm saying this as we progress through the conclusion of John chapter six through the next three uh, grab bag lessons, in fact. But for now, let's just dive in, and pardon the pun, We'll dive into the nautical miracle slash lesson that John records in his gospel. Last week, I gave you an assignment to read John chapter 6 and Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 56. If you haven't read those chapters, you're not going to be able to read the entire chapter of John right now, because it, John chapter 6, because it is a, an extended chapter. But if you want to push pause, and go ahead and read John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21, 6, 16 through 21, and then jump back in your Bible to Mark chapter 6, and read verses 45 through 56, 45, so they're both chapter 6, but they're different uh, verse sections, but that will get you, again, if you'll pardon the pun, that'll get you in the same boat mentally with the rest of us. Okay, Jesus had fed the multitude. Cleanup of leftovers had been managed. 
The disciples got an early dismissal, and they were told by Jesus, according to Mark's gospel, to go ahead of Jesus to Bethsaida. Now, some of you Sherlock's may be thinking, aha, I found an error in the Bible. The feeding of the 5,000 took place in Bethsaida, and now the disciples are told to go ahead of Jesus to Bethsaida. Well, how can they go ahead of Jesus to where they already are? The explanation is really very simple, and I bet if you thought long enough, you would figure it out. So let, let me give you a couple clues, since you're Sherlock's and all. West of me, about 30 miles, is California. They have a university there. Northeast of me is Indiana. Does that help? How about this clue? West of me is Bethany, Pennsylvania. Across the Ohio border is Bethany. North of Indianapolis is Bethany. And the hometown of Lazarus outside of Jerusalem was Bethany. Did that help? Okay, one more. In Kansas is Pittsburgh, and in Pennsylvania is Pittsburgh. So now you have it figured out, right? There was a Bethsaida on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Greeks called it the Sea of Tiberias. But there was also a port a few miles away on the western shore, just outside of Capernaum, that was named, you guessed it, Bethsaida often called Bethsaida of Galilee, to distinguish it from the other. So John says the disciples headed off to Capernaum, but Mark mentions Bethsaida. Why the difference? Well, it comes back to what we talked about earlier, uh, context. John is writing to more of a Greek audience who would identify more with the larger city of Capernaum while Mark's audience is more of a Jewish crowd, which would be more likely to know the specific small town of Bethsaida of Galilee. So it comes, you see, it's, it's context. John uses the former name, Capernaum, and Mark uses the latter name, Bethsaida. Now, back to our narrative. Jesus sends the disciples via boat to Capernaum while, like a lot of preachers on Sunday mornings, he cleans up. He shakes the people out the door, so to speak, and then he turns out the lights. And by turning out the lights, I meant that the sun was setting. Jesus goes off for a refreshing time alone with his father after sunset. The disciples are gone. They're out on the lake. Can we ever say enough about the value of prayer? Can we ever pray too much? Jesus is our example. Pray. Meanwhile, the disciples are out on the water when the Sirocco winds cause a flash storm in pitch darkness. I've only been on one cruise in my life, and oh my goodness, it has to be about at least 30 years ago. I was asked to go and do some concerts on a, on a cruise, and everything was just fine until we were one whole day or two whole days, something like that at sea and a storm came up. And I, could, I remember being out, stepping out, you know, onto the, the, the deck, what for better term, looking out and seeing the storm off in the distance. Other than that, everything was pitch black, but the boat was rocking and the waves were um, white capping and, <laughs> For a land lover like me, that was um, very, very, very scary. We even, on that tour, <laughs> three-hour tour, hey, we, on that tour, we even stopped to pick up some refugees. They were Cuban refugees that were, believe it or not, on giant inner tubes. They would float out into shipping channels in the hopes of getting uh, picked up because the rule was that a ship had to stop and pick up refugees. And so we did a turnaround, went back and picked them up and took them on board. And I thought, how, how brave, desperate me, perhaps, these guys must have been to be on an inner tube out there at night on the sea. And what if a storm came up? And maybe it did while they were out there. I, I don't know. 
but that, that was truly frightening. And so the disciples were afraid and they were working hard. Mark tells us that Jesus saw them straining at the oars because the winds were against them. Well, about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them. Now the fourth watch, that's between three and 6 a.m. I read one time that the fourth watch was known as the devil's watch because that was supposedly when the demons were active and when, in fact, they say that more criminals are active like at 4 a.m. If you're gonna rob your house and you're inside, they're gonna come around 4 a.m. because that's when people are in their deepest REM sleep. And so this is like, these guys have been working all day. They've helped distribute food and collect food for feeding the 5,000. Now they're out on the water. It's between three and 6 a.m. The devil's watch. And they are exhausted. It, it's pitch black out there. There's no ambient light coming from the shores or anything. I mean, they didn't have electric lights. These guys are out there in the middle of the lake with the storm and the wind and they're tired and exhausted. Trouble has come on them swiftly. Jesus went out to them, the Bible says, walking on the lake. Mark writes an interesting and confusing insight when he says he was about to pass them by. Hmm. We know that Mark sees Jesus as son of God and Lord, miracle worker, compassionate savior. So we know this statement was not meant to discredit Jesus. When Mark wrote his gospel, this incident with Peter was in the past, so he knew the end result. He could have just skipped over that particular item, and he could have moved on to big stuff, you know, about Peter's dilemma and Peter's rescue. Why did Mark include this observation, he was about to pass them by, which by the way, it was Peter's observation, because we understand that Mark was more or less scribing for Peter. Mark wasn't there. He wasn't an eyewitness. Peter was. And so Mark was writing on behalf of Peter. Peter was an unschooled fisherman. And so Mark was more adept at writing things down while Peter shared his thoughts. So it's Peter who remembers this incident that Jesus was about to pass them by. How did, how does Peter even know that? Well, just don't forget, we don't have, or yeah, don't forget that, that we don't have all the dialogue. <laughs> there were times we read in scripture that Jesus would teach and then later he would discuss the teaching or explain it to his disciples. Um, and so probably Maybe when they got in the boat, maybe another, the next day or whatever, they talked about this event and Jesus probably said, you know, guys, I, I was thinking I was just gonna pass you by. I, I don't know. Maybe we can ask Mark when we get to heaven. Well, at least I'm, I can ask Mark when I get to heaven. I mean, <laughs> you go, <laughs> I hope you're going to heaven. I hope see you there. Um, I have never heard explanations, or I have heard, you can tell it's early on a Sunday morning here. I have heard explanations that Jesus had intended to pass them by, phrased like this. Number one, that he was going to lead them through the storm to shore. That he wasn't going to get in the boat, that he would just go ahead of them and lead them through the storm to the shore. Or number two, that he would pass them by after calming the storm from outside the boat. And the only reason that Jesus got in the boat was because of the incident with Peter attempting to walk on water. That before then Jesus was, would have come up to them, he would have calmed the storm, and then he would have led them to shore. I, I don't know, None of, no one really knows. No one knows why Mark included this incident that Peter, mentioned to him. 
but it's an interesting insight. Um, maybe you have one, right? You can share it with somebody. So anyway, the disciples are straining at the oars, but they're not so distracted that they miss a figure coming into view out of the darkness. Now, Bible says they're terrified. Wouldn't you be? I would be terrified. I mean, they maybe they had maritime sailors tales, you know, about wraiths on the water or whatever, you know, myths that sailors came up with and old salt tales. I don't know. Was that playing in their minds or was it just a matter of, yikes, you know, look at what we see. They're terrified already and then they see this. So they're doubly frightened. There's a ghost in the storm and there's a storm surrounding them. Well, Mark includes this word next. He says, immediately, immediately, Jesus spoke to them. Immediately. He saw their distress and immediately spoke. And this is what he said. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, I truly can't overspeak the importance of these words. You must get this message of Jesus to truly understand this as more than a sailor's tale. Why are these words so important? It is I, do not be afraid. First of all, because it's Jesus emphasizing his identity, and I'll explain that. Secondly, because those words are as important for us to remember in our storms of life as they were for the disciples to hear in their storm. So let's break that down. I said these are important words because Jesus' statement was his own statement of identity. And I'll explain that further. Now, Russ Gratton was only a teenager when he was helping Moses herd sheep in the desert of Midian. But Russ remembers hearing God tell Moses to go to Egypt and lead the Israelites out of captivity. What, Russ was really excited because if you know Russ, he loves to travel and he always wanted to visit Egypt. And Moses, though, before he left, asked God for identification. He said, if I go, who should I say sent me? And God gave himself a name. Tell them, God said, that I am has sent you. And this will be my name for all generations. So in other words, if God wore a name tag, I am would be in capital letters on the tag. Probably all caps with like little lightning bolts all around it. Well, that name, I am, translated into Greek is ego, I, me. I always used to think of ego, let go of my waffle, let go of my ego, you know. Ego, from which we get our word ego, ego, I, me, I am. Now, if you turn back to John chapter 8, can you do that quickly? I, I don't want to take much time here. But just turn to John chapter 8, two, two chapters away from where we are. John chapter 8 records a very, very heated dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees. Jesus didn't win any fans when he said, according, we'll begin in verse 42, Jesus said to them, to the Pharisees, if God were your father, which they claimed, and so he's saying, if, if he really was your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Oh. In their face, Jesus, telling the truth straight up. John concludes this confrontation with these words found in verses 54 and moving forward. Jesus said, my father 
whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. <laughs> Jesus is telling these people, you, you say you know God. You don't know God. You know, you're, you're a child of Satan. You speak lies, which is Satan's native language. And though you do not know him, I know him. And if I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You're, you're not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, listen, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, either Jesus has a, a very poor grasp of grammar, or Jesus is saying something, before Abraham was born, I am. And at this, they picked up stones to stone him. Well, why did they want to stone Jesus? Because when you look at the name that Jesus gave himself, he was identifying himself as God. And to them, that was blasphemy. The Greek translation, like I said, is ego I me. I am. And Mark tells us that Jesus, when, when he approached the disciples that night, I mean, this is the one statement that Jesus said immediately, take courage. It is I am. I am is here with you. Jesus said to them, ego, I me. When Jesus is recognized by the disciples, when they are frightened, thinking they see an apparition floating on the water, the first thing Jesus tells them is, ego, I me. Don't be afraid. I am. You got this. I am with you. I am is with you. God is present and accounted for. Your strongest resource is on sight. And now we know why Peter would be bold enough to say to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, then tell me to come to you on the water. Now, what would even possess a man in a boat in the middle of a raging storm to step out of a boat? You see, it's because they understood Jesus was saying, I am God. God is here with you. And so Peter says, okay, if it's you, then tell me to come to you on the water. Peter's boldness is almost like a real life, oh yeah, prove it. But I don't think it was that. I think it was more of a, I know you are. I know you're God. And since you're walking on the water, then invite me to come out there. Let me do the same thing. Peter, in stepping out of the boat, Peter had to believe that Jesus was God. Peter told Jesus it was up to Jesus to give the command. You tell me to come to you. And so Jesus did. I wonder if Peter regretted that. <laughs> Maybe expect Jesus to say, no, I'll, I'll come in the boat. I'll get in there with you. Nah. But note to self here. When steps in life seem scary, wait on the Lord. Wait for him to give a command. Wait for him to lead you and tell you what to do. <laughs> Seek him and follow him. But what other courage Jesus or Peter displays when he steps out of the boat? He doesn't say, I believe you are the I am, but show it first by calming the storm. And then when the storm is calm, I'll step out of the boat. You know, like settle things out first. I saw you calm a storm, jokingly, just a few chapters back when you were asleep and you, we woke you up and you calmed the storm. I saw that. So let's start with that, Jesus. Why don't you just calm the storm, a calming miracle? That'll be good. And then invite me and I'll step out. Now, Peter steps out of the boat in the middle of the storm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's my life application warning. And 
you probably know what this life application is. And that is trust Jesus in the storm. Don't wait for everything to settle out or expect God to calm everything down before you trust him. So Peter begins his miracle walk wonderfully. In fact, you'd think he was an a professional with experience. Mark says in 1429, Peter got out of the boat and walked on water toward Jesus. Yay, Peter! But alas, Peter took his focus off Jesus and saw the storm and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! I wish I could shout it right now. Lord, save me! Again, Matthew uses that word immediately. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. It's good thing it was immediately because it doesn't take much for a big burly fisherman to sink in the water in a storm. So we need to remember Jesus' statement, ego, I me, I am, because it identified him as God. But we also need to remember it because it is as powerful a truth for us to anchor to in our figurative storms of life as it was for the disciples to hear in their literal storm. Okay, so we're going to pause here because it's getting late. How about a bit of application before closing our lesson? I would suspect that Jesus is immediately is not always our immediately. Let me re-say that. I would suspect that Jesus's definition, that's what the definition of immediately, is not always our definition of immediately, okay? Immediately for us is, <laughs> in fact, immediately for us is before the storm or after a, a, a minor bit of suffering, but not in the middle of the storm, or the middle of our near drowning in sorrow, in red ink, in divorce papers, in COVID symptoms, or just fill in the blank. We don't want, Jesus, don't wait until I'm in the middle of that. You know, come in beforehand or even just early on. Why does God's perfect timing conflict with my immediate timing? Why does God's perfect timing often conflict with my immediate timing? Well, <laughs> that's a topic for another grab bag. But let me encourage you to do in your storms what Peter did in his, and that is to cry out to Jesus to save you. His immediate answer may not be what you prefer, or it may be the right uh, time answer. But don't let go. He knows you have been on the water straining at the oars. And I can't guarantee for you any more than I could guarantee for me, for instance, when my wife was dying, that he will wave a miracle wand and just calm the storm. I did learn, though, that trusting in him will calm the storm in your heart. Peter had one of two decisions. He could reach out for Jesus, or he could sink to the deep six. He chose the best option. He cried to Jesus for help. And so, friends, with all the love I have for you, I was just remind you, please, do the same. Reach to Jesus. Call to him. The Bible says, when they led Jesus in the boat, immediately the storm ceased. Don't leave Jesus out there on the water with a mental belief of, yeah, I, I think you're the son of God. E ego, I mean, yeah, you are, I am. Let him into the boat. Let him into your life. The answer may not be an immediate calming as it was in this story. But your heart will find peace and your heart will find calm. And Jesus will lead you to the shore. See, that's the thing. Jesus told the disciples, go to Capernaum. He didn't say, go out there, find yourself in a storm and die. 
No. Capernaum, one way or another, they would be in Capernaum. And so Jesus tells us, we're going to the other side. Eventually, that other side is heaven. But I won't leave you or forsake you in the journey. I'll be right there. But don't just think of me as the God outside the boat who cares. Invite me into your life. Invite me into the storms of your life. Invite me into the calm times of your life. And allow me to work in your heart. You see, who you let in your boat makes a sea of difference when you're in a storm. Who you let in your boat makes a sea of difference in your storm. So invite Jesus in. Thanks again for sharing in this time. And I, I hope, boy, there was, there's a, this story about Peter and walking on the water. It, it just, <laughs> there are so many angles of it. Okay. So our half hour is up. There are just so many inflections of it and so many good applications that you can make with it. And I hope that the ones that we made today have encouraged you, okay? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth you preserve for us. Thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you for the rescuer, Jesus. Look forward, Father, to the day that we reach the other side and we see you face to face when the storms are all over. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.